Now you're going to hear about hacking Rembrandt from an old printmaking geek. I've been hacking Rembrandt for nigh on to 50 years. And when I was invited to talk at Ignite Seattle, I thought about Pablos Holman talking about hacking. He said hackers are good at taking things apart, putting them back together in different ways they weren't intended to be used. And he also said at his talk on Zeitgeist Americas 2013 that it was time for hackers to turn their attention to more important things than the next app for an iPod or some, as he put it, fart-ass game. And when he, when he said that, I thought artists, too, could be working on world's problems, the most important problems in the world, maybe in collaboration with hackers. Rembrandt painted great masterpieces, but maybe artists need to turn their attention away from great masterpieces. So I took a kind of time travel to get closer to Rembrandt's time. I imagined what it would be like in 1660. And I thought, first of all, that printmaking uh, was a big industry. Printing was a big industry in, in, in uh, Amsterdam at that time. Artists would uh, turn their paintings into engravings and etchings. It's a kind of a reproduction process. And in my deep research, uh, going back as I was working on a novel called Rembrandt's Ghost in the New Machine, um, I discovered that Rembrandt had been hacking printmaking. And after a couple of, of tries at printmaking, he bought his own press in 1629. And that was the beginning of his great hack. So Rembrandt was a hacker too. He hacked the technology of his day, which was printing. And by having his own press, he could work plates in ways that the professional engravers and marketers never, never would allow. So uh, he hacked etching. And in my hacking Rembrandt, this is what I discovered. And when you had your own press, or if you had your own workstation, your own computer, uh, you could hack the technologies of your time. So his story didn't have a happy ending, but while he worked in his career, he was able to go out into the streets and uh, sketch homeless people and vulgarities. He could do erotica if he wanted to. He was the first etcher to go outside with a plate and draw, called plain air etching. He could use himself as a model. He could hack his own face for facial expressions for his prints. Uh, so he was a, a hacker in his own way. Well, as I said, my hacking of Rembrandt's time took me back to his portraiture, but uh, I was teaching at the University of Washington in printmaking, so uh, not only did I hack back 350 years, I hacked back 30,000 years to the caves of the prehistoric art. And I pictured a painter on one side doing the laborious process of painting an image, and next to them another person uh, using their hand as a stencil and blowing pigment around their hand to create a kind of a print. Well, that was the invention of a template. So that was my great hack, was to understand the template as the origin of printmaking. And since the template is the basis of technology, I brought this back to my printmaking students, and they took up video, uh, video being the, the state of the art in the 1970s. And they, in, an, in a sense, invaded the printmaking studios with their video cameras and their video monitors and switchers and special effects generators. They made installations, uh, they did performance work. So we were hacking technology and it was suitable in a way because Seattle was like Rembrandt's time. Uh, in 1660s, Seattle in the, in, the year, in the 20th century was a hotbed of technology. So my great hack now became to go full circle, you could say, uh, return to the printing press and hack the printing press, hack Rembrandt's printing press, that wooden press, miniaturize it, turn it into a toy that almost anybody could use, even grown-ups or kids or whatever. So my great, hack, my great hack will be to turn the printing press into a platform for games, distance learning, that kind of thing. Well, thanks for listening to this. I'm Bill Ritchie.